when it comes to movies and music and television and streaming, when it comes to culture, he is without peer. He's the culture blaster, and he comes and goes on a rainbow. How about it for the great Michael Snyder, everyone? Greetings and salutations to the marvelous Marky Mouth and, of course, Queen Kim. Uh, <laughs> if Albert's around, Albert, if it's yes, Tony, hello Thank to everybody. Yeah, um, Tony, no, right? Everybody's here. Good job. I, I have to say, uh, you know, Christy Gnome is the only gnome I wouldn't want in my garden. <laughs> all right. That is She's got that. Uh, she's got that weapon with her at all times, you know. Right. Well, she's, I guess she'd protect the plants and what have you if she was yeah, back there. Yeah, that is true. No, that's true. I, I, I don't want protection. anything to do with her. Um, let's talk about uh, something uh, cool and fun and positive. Hardly strictly bluegrass. The massive free music festival in Golden Gate Park is happening this weekend. I am uh, on a San Francisco leg of my coastal commute. You know, I live between here and Los Angeles, as yes, as sir. the Cognoscenti, no. You want to hit the dinger? Well, yeah, a cognoscenti is clearly a ding word. Um, and I am up in San Francisco for a bit. Uh, you know, I don't do outdoor festivals, uh, and I don't do windows, so don't ask. Uh, but I am almost tempted to check out the legendary New Orleans soul singer and R&B legend Irma Thomas, who will be uh, playing Hardly Strictly. Check the schedules via uh, any online uh, Hardly Strictly info dumps. And uh, Irma Thomas, highly recommended. But there are a lot of people playing, and there's a lot of enthusiasm for that. And, of course, our 49ers are playing the Cardinals on Sunday. Trust me, that's a day we'll, I, I will be avoiding everything but a TV screen. Let's mm. put it that way. Yeah, they're favored by two touchdowns, Michael Snyder. I don't know about You that. know, uh, we talked a little bit about the Folsom Street Fair last week, and I guess I shouldn't have been surprised when I went there at the large number of hot sausage stands. <laughs> I was like, yeah. really? You're selling sausages? At the Folsom Street Fair, hey, uh, look, despite people in full body animal costumes and uh, two guys I saw in Mandalorian helmets and little else, it was definitely not Disneyland. That's all I'll say about uh, the Folsom okay. Street Fair. Uh, oh, wait, one more, one more quick note. You talked about the, the, the cleanest bathroom in America. Is yeah. that right? In Washington? That's um, right. There, there were um, porta potties everywhere at the Folsom Street Fair, and I don't know what was going on inside them, but I will tell you that every time I see a Honey Bucket brand ported potty, I feel a little queasy. There's just oh. something about the name <laughs> Honey Bucket that yeah. throws me off a bit. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I <laughs> There's never been anything like this. All right, Michael, take me to a movie review, Gut. All right, all right. I, I do uh, point out that, um, like last week's unfortunate genre franchise entry, Expendables 4, uh, we've got the release of a new installment of a long-running series. In this case, uh, it's the 10th chapter in the horror movie franchise, Saw, which, if you know, uh, is built around the plight of people having to choose increasingly grisly and gory ways to die by an unhinged psychopath named Jigsaw. They never yeah, caught Saw Jigsaw in all of this, huh? Yeah, yeah. So, still out uh, there. Saw, okay. Saw 10 is marketed as Saw X, you know, as in the Roman numeral. Um, All right. uh, but uh, did I see Saw? No, I didn't see Saw, meaning uh, no review I, here. I get it. I get it. Okay. No, yeah. Pu no publicist approached me and said, say, would you like to see Saw? Uh, anyway, I didn't seek to see Saw, so uh, it remained unseen by me. So let's talk about the movie. Well, it's interesting, by the way, just the original Saw franchise was also, I think, not provided to reviewers ahead of time. And no studio wanted to fund and distribute Saw. So producers got the money themselves, and now look at it. How many Saw movies have there been? It's one of the most successful this, horror franchises in history. This is 10, but the the um, sadism of it is so unrelenting, yeah. and their are uh, inventive ways to... Um, Torture and kill people. Yeah, it's awful. Heal death. I, I just, you know, there's a point where there's no, you know, uh, payoff that's worth going to see these things, you know? Sure. yeah. Anyway, anyway, let's talk about a movie of, of some degree of worth. Uh, as the fall movie season, often re uh, referred to as the start of awards season, uh, starts to rev up, we have the release of a big-budget science fiction extravaganza that mm -hmm. looked impressive, and, uh, man, it sprawls across the widescreen. It's called The Creator, and despite its futuristic setting, it's not so far in the future that we don't hear familiar pop songs on the soundtrack, and, oh, yeah, 
The main thrust is the viability and potential danger of artificial intelligence, robots, you know, sentient or not, and the rights of such constructs. Yeah, it's the AI conundrum, uh, which is in our faces a lot these days, whether conundrum. it's about yeah. uh, the uses of chat GPT uh, or the impact of AI on the creative arts, a significant element of the WGA and SAG strikes, right? Yeah. Anyhow, the creator was directed by Gareth Edwards, whose Rogue One was the best Star Wars big screen spinoff to date, and whose 2014 revival of Godzilla was solid, but not quite as good as his first giant monster kaiju movie, 2010's Monsters, which, by the way, is worth seeking out on streaming. So expectations were high for the creator, which is nominally about the future struggle for dominance between humans and human-like AI people put that in quotes yeah. john I'm doing david nominal nominal yeah. john david yep. washington is uh joshua a black op uh, black op soldier in the war uh between uh, america or its future equivalent uh which has been victimized by an ai instigated catastrophe and other ai on the planet so this sort of America is trying to wipe out all AI and a coalition of Asian territories is providing safe harbor to generally upstanding robots and androids. So the Western forces are sending in troops supposedly in secret to destroy the communities of AI uh, and basically collateral damage be damned. Uh, so wait a so minute. So they're going to the Asian territories where they are fostering these kinds of AI robots. And so it's, a, yes. is that right? Okay. Yeah. Yes. So they're doing what, is, what are ostensibly secret, um, you know, uh, operations, but I right. don't know. There are lots of explosions, Mark. I don't, I'll say, it's, I don't, it's tough to stay secret with all those explosions. Uh, ostensibly. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, yeah. In the, in the tumult of one military operation, tumult. Joshua, yeah. an advanced scout who has gone native is separated from his pregnant wife, played by Gemma Chan, coincidentally, uh, 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 of the great TV series Humans, which is uh, also about AI sentience and rights, and, and also the Marvel movie Eternals. So anyway, Joshua doesn't know if his wife is dead or alive, and in the aftermath of that tragedy, he's conscripted to find a weapon in the Asian zone that was built to bring down humanity, and what he finds is not what he expected. So the actors, inc yeah. including Allison Janney as a uh, hard-ass colonel and Kenton Watanabe as, I think, an android or, or a human-shaped AI, uh, they're all great. The set pieces and effects are stunning to see, and the ideas are intriguing with the conflicts, uh, deliberate echoes of the Vietnam War. In a lot of ways, you, look and, you, know, you feel like you're looking at Vietnam War footage, right? But robots. Anyway, the setup the execution and geopolit uh, geopolitical nature of the conflict and the provenance and the classes of AI are not clearly defined. And despite this spectacular nature, the end game is kind of borderline senseless. Uh, the creator suffers from sloppy world building, and that's on Edwards and his co-screenwriter, Chris uh, Weitz, who, who has done great stuff in the past. Um, uh, as Dave Letterman's old comedian pal, George Miller, used to say, buy the premise and you buy the bit. I may have been <laughs> dazzled by much of the creator, but I never thoroughly bought it. Uh, it's in theaters and, uh, you know, caveat emptor. All right. Uh, what else do you have? Muzzle. Muzzle starts off promisingly as the story of a Los Angeles policeman and his partner who happens to be a four-legged member of the LAPD Canine Corps. The cop, played by Aaron Eckhart, who got his start in uh, the terrific low-budget uh, drama in the Company of Men, and his dog, played by a German shepherd, uh, again, provenance unknown here, uh, they're on patrol when they're called to a crime scene where the machinations of a violent, powerful gang of drug dealers set the story in motion. You know, there are... There are some good things about muzzle, mostly the depiction of the bond shared by policemen and police dogs. But there are also a lot of gratuitous interactions between the cop and other humans that are not really fleshed out enough. Uh, it's directed in very conventional style by John Stahlberg Jr. And it eventually descends into rather obvious cops and criminals conflict. But it's short on, on coherence and uh, short on believable spikes. Uh, believable stakes. I, it's nice to see Stephen Lang, by the way, the heavy in the Avatar movies, playing an LAPD officer who trains the dogs for departmental use. Alas, Muzzle, uh, despite its possibilities, 
is is a dog. Uh, one on the shaggy side. Uh, okay. It's in theaters <laughs> and available for streaming. Muzzle. Ah, muzzle. He looks like Reacher a bit, says Square. TJ yeah, Hooker yeah. way better, says Champagne Wishes. <laughs> yeah, I, I'll tell you what. I, I am really excited uh, for the second season of Reacher. Uh, bring it on. Alan Richmond is is great. I, I'm really – that's, I think, in November or December. But let's move on to something yes, kind of fascinating and something I really enjoyed and, and not a big time suck. Are you ready? Yes, sir. Some may say uh, that the filmmaker Wes Anderson is a bit on the smug, pretentious, and self-indulgent side – and when I say some, I mean me, uh, but <laughs> his, his intellectual gymnastics and his dry, deadpan wit and, and the bold, uh, color-coordinated visuals of his movies uh, can be thrilling, uh, aided and abetted by the uh, myriad A-list actors who eagerly agree to be part of his projects. You know, I may shrug or roll my eyes at Asteroid City and bemoan the unevenness of the French Dispatch. But I was enthralled by his Moonrise Kingdom, uh, the Grand Budapest Hotel, and the fantastic Mr. Fox, the latter being his stop-motion animation adaptation of a book by the mordantly witty author Roald Dahl. You want to ding mordantly? I want to ding mordantly. I want to ding bemoaned. And I want to ding um, something else you said. And I can't think of what it was. So, all right, go ahead. Anyway, uh, uh, Dahl is also the writer behind Charlie and the Chocolate Factory and Matilda. So you basically can get oh, the, wow. uh, the sensibility here. I am happy to report um, that the first of Anderson's four short films for Netflix, uh, adapting some lesser known works by Dahl, is quite a treat. It's called The Wonderful Story of Henry Sugar, and it concerns a wealthy guy known as Henry Sugar, naturally. Uh, he's played by Benedict Cumberbatch, who is part of Anderson's repertory cast for the uh, four shorts. Sugar loves to gamble, learns of a guru played by Ben Kingsley, who can see without the use of his eyes and decides to have the guru teach him the trick in order to win at gambling by seeing the faces of cards before they're turned. So it's a cool idea, and it goes in an unlikely place, and it's kind of uplifting. And the cast also features Rafe Fiennes as author Roald Dahl, Dev Patel as a researcher, and Richard Ayoade as a yogi. And uh, five of the top liners play dual roles in the project, and most of them are slated to appear in the three other Anderson Dahl films. And kind of in typical Anderson fashion, the wonderful story of Henry Sugar looks fantastic and has his wry sensibilities, which align with Dahl's own. Uh, I would say this sugar is a, a sweet little delight, and it oh. comes in at roughly, I don't know, 45 minutes, 39 minutes, not very long at all. So it's on Netflix, and so are the uh, three other uh, Dahl adaptations. Uh, I wow. recommend Henry Sugar. Yeah, that's something. That's really terrific. Great. I like to hear it. Okay, so we didn't have time last week to talk about No One Will Save You, and it was absolutely uh, meriting coverage because I thought it was really, really good. Uh, it's a, um alien invasion thriller uh, starring Kat, uh, Caitlin Deaver, the young actress uh, who was in uh, Booksmart and various other films. She's on the rise. She's really wonderful in this. Unfriendly but scientifically curious extraterrestrials invade Earth at first in what seems to be a one-ship exploratory mission. It isn't. Uh, in any case, we see the invasion from the perspective of a damaged and ostracized but plucky young woman whose mom has died and who is now living a distance outside a small town where she's kind of a pariah for reasons that become apparent over the course of the movie. Uh, so. She quickly learns there's more than just one invader, and it becomes a fight for survival, kind of like Ripley versus the alien in the Aliens movies. No. Uh, so our outcast actually kills an alien, pissing off the other aliens who want to <laughs> get her under control and examine what makes her tick. So yeah. she's really resourceful. Uh, but they, you know, they eventually kind of get what they wanted to say more would be sinful. Um, but apparently they kind of want to mentally enslave the whole planet. Uh, um, I really was impressed with this. Uh, I thought that uh, No One Will Save You, uh, which is uh, written and directed by Brian Duffield, uh, 
kicked ass. Deaver was wonderful. Uh, there is a, a, a lovely and strange twist at the end, and it is available on Hulu. Wow. And so, hey, stream, baby, stream it at your pleasure, then you're saying. Yeah. Absolutely. I really got a kick out of No One Will Save You. It's a sci-fi movie with creepy th- uh, aspects that even you, a hater of gore, would probably enjoy. I'm on board with it. I'm, you're, I'll probably watch it this weekend. Uh, Kim, I'm going to ask you, because you have this other show that you do, Will they let, can we have uh, Michael do one more? Would you mind? It, I think uh, she's muted, but I can. she says, okay. Yeah, go ahead. Um, well, I don't want to talk about any more movies this week. I do want to talk about Crapopolis on Fox. It is an animated comedy about an ancient Greek city uh, and the idiots who live there. And it comes from writer-producer Dan Harmon, who uh, also was in large part behind the sitcom community and the very well-loved cartoon Rick and Morty. So in Crapopolis, Tyrannus, the hapless mortal son of the goddess Deliria, and a half-man, half-maticor named Schlub is trying to establish his own city-state, and he does so in incompetent fashion. This is rapid-fire funny stuff with plenty of satirical uh, observations about civilization then and now. And it doesn't hurt that Tyrannus and his parents are voiced by giants of British comedy, starting with Richard Ayoade, who we mentioned is in the uh, Wes Anderson movie, uh, playing Tyrannus, Hannah Waddingham, uh, so wonderful in um, uh, Ted Lasso uh, as his mom and Matt Berry of um, various projects, including Toast of London and What We Do in the Shadows playing Daddy. I was totally I went in there with a bit of a chip on my shoulder. You know, some of these Fox animated shows, not great. This knocked me out. I was totally um, amused and entertained by Crapopolis on Fox. And uh, for those of you who like sword and sorcery, sticking to animation, Castlevania Nocturne just dropped on Netflix. It's a sequel to the Warren Ellis penned animated series based on a popular video game franchise with mystical kingdoms and vampires and magicians. And despite its origins as part of the video game mania, I thought Castlevania was absolutely great and i'm looking forward to um, nocturne so that's i don't know how you do it but you do it you review and you take in so many of these things it's just amazing to me again castlevania he loved crapopolis he loved these are two animated things that really come to life for uh, the culture blaster no one will save you there's the um crapopolis crew no one will save you is the uh new streamer on hulu didn't get to it that last week, but got to it this week because Michael says it's really a good ride, an alien invasion thriller. I'm looking forward to it. The wonderful story of Henry Sugar, the Wes Anderson-helmed piece with Cumberbatch, with Kingsley, with his coterie of actors and contributors. It's supposed to be great, according to Michael. Was really happy with it. He doesn't always love Wes Anderson stuff. But he likes the wonderful story of Henry Sugar, and it comes in at only 45 minutes. That's on Netflix. Muzzle brings together this canine core cop and Aaron Eckhart. And Michael said, mm, mm, Yeah, it kind mm. of falls apart. It kind of falls yeah. apart. And finally, the creator, the sci fi offering from the director of Rogue One and Monsters, he said, uh, well, if you buy the premise, maybe you'll like the movie. The premise, though, is shaky, and it's very hard to buy. <laughs> the, the, the world building is problematic. It, it's it, it's a dazzler on the big screen, and no complaints about John David Washington. He's a sturdy leading man, and and the support from uh, the likes of Janny and Gemma Chan, also good. I just wish it had been more intelligently conceived from the get-go. No. I think that's the issue. So uh, bottom line is there's a lot good in it, but it just doesn't quite make the finish line for the Culture Blaster. Uh, Loved our uh, visit, and go Niners. I'm excited that you'll be – will you be in San Francisco next week or in Los Angeles next week? Get back and forth. I believe I'll be in San Francisco for another week or two um, at least. But in the meantime, will I be at Levi Stadium? I give that a hearty no. (laughs) Okay, You will not be at Levi's, but you will be there in spirit. Uh, He comes and goes on a rainbow. Bye, Michael. Fare thee well, everyone. Yeah. Wow. Very impressive.